Okay, good afternoon. It's great to see all of you here on this beautiful day. I wish we could do it outside. Yeah. Right. So thank you all for joining us today to celebrate the installation of Anka Pavlescu as the this lot Diekman Professor in Comparative Literature. On behalf of Washu and the School of Arts and Sciences, I extend my warmest welcome to all of you here in person or watching our live stream. We are delighted to have two of Anka's family members joining us. Is it just one or two? Opportunity to learn about the outstanding work of our faculty. I'm struck by the breadth of all we do in arts and sciences, individually and collectively, the vision and work of our faculty coalesce and converge to make arts and sciences more collaborative, more impactful, more adept at bringing forth research that advances foundational knowledge and sparks new paths of inquiry. And this brings me to our honorary today, Professor Anka Pavlescu, who is doing the kind of transformative work that has become a hallmark of our university. Anka's field shifting research spans the topics of international modernism, affect theory, Eastern Europe, and the history of comparatism. Like the global literature movement she's studying, Anka's work has had an international impact in multiple fields. This year, her new book, Queerizing the Modern, Transylvania Across empires received awards from both the American Comparative Literature Association and the American Sociological Association. Congratulations, Anka. Anka's research is also profoundly relevant to the challenges of our, of our time. One of her books in progress, I'm looking forward to reading the book, connects a cultural history of the face to contemporary technologies of facial recognition. In addition to her four books, her influential scholarship has resulted in 30 published journal articles. Anka is a widely admired and award-winning teacher, mentor, and colleagues on our campus. And in just a moment, you're gonna hear more from her department chair, Abraham Van Engang, about her significant impact among our students and our faculty. Endowed chairs such, such as Ankas are catalysts for recruiting and retaining the brightest minds to our shield. And for continuing cutting edge collaborative research, novel discovery, and global solutions to arts and sciences. We're so grateful for the support of the Lisa Lott Diekman Professorship in Comparative Literature, endowed by William Howard Matheson. Dr. Matheson was a professor of comparative literature at Washu for 25 years until his retirement in 1996. He was a distinguished poet and translator who taught courses on almost 100 different topics, including narrative and drama, lyric poetry, and numerous cross-cultural themes, particularly those involving comparisons of European, American, Chinese, and Japanese writing. Matheson's gift honors his colleague in comparative literature, Lisa Lott Diekman, who he considered an outstanding teacher and an inspired mentor. I hope you all get inspired. You can honor your colleague that way. So. <laughs> Dr. Diekman grew up in Frankfurt, Germany, where she had broad exposure to the classical and liberal arts. After studying languages and literatures at German universities, she received a doctoral degree from the University of Heidelberg in 1927. She then moved with her family to St. Louis in 1938 and joined the Washu faculty in 1945. At Washu, Dr. Diekman was known for her energy, creativity, and intellectual curiosity. She was also a trailblazer. In 1963, she became one of the first female department chairs at WashU. During her many years at WashU, she carved out a distinguished career 
as a scholar of German and French literature. Even after her retirement in 1971, she continued to translate books, deliver guest lectures, and champion greater emphasis on the humanities at American universities, especially at WashU. We are grateful for the academic commitments of Professor Stigman and Matheson, and we are proud to continue their great legacy of promoting the value of the humanities for future generations. And now I would like to invite Abraham Van Ingan, Chair of the English Department, to come up to the podium to speak in greater detail about Anka as a distinguished scholar and teacher. Welcome, everyone. It's great to see you here tonight. It's great to be here for this awesome uh, occasion. It's my great pleasure and honor tonight to be able to introduce my esteemed colleague, Anka Parvalescu. I'll cut to the chase. Anka is awesome. <laughs> that's, that's the main thing you need to know. You have her profile in your program. You can see for yourself the accomplishments, four books, 30 articles, all of it the highest caliber, all of it placed in the best journals, the best press, presses reaching far and wide and winning multiple awards. It's my job tonight to give you just a bit more detail about what makes all this work so amazing, apart from the sheer fact that it is so much work. Uh, it's, she is vastly productive, I would say enviously uh, productive. Let me start with the range. A book on laughter, a book on women's labor and migration, multiple works on the meaning of Europe and how we conceive of its relations work on race and the Roma, intellectual history, gender studies, queer theory, affect theory, feminist theory, post-colonial studies, I could go on. Anka has not just transformed literary modernism and comparative literature, her primary field and discipline, but also changed the way we understand all kinds of important topics. And here's one example of how it works. Take the introduction to the traffic in women's work on East European migration and the making of Europe. Let me list for you just a few of the figures of note, a few theorists and writers who appear in these pages. Umberto Eco, Vaclav Havel, Immanuel Kant, Jacques Derrida, Deepish Chakrabarty, Daniel Defoe, Baljak, James Clifford, J.G.A. Pocock, Claude Levi Strauss, Gail Rubin, Michel Foucault, Lee Edelman, and Louis Althusser, and that's just the introduction. Actually, that's just the first half of the introduction, <laughs> to be frank. Really, the point is not how well-read Anka is, but rather how well she pulls together so many different thoughts, theories, and writings. These figures weave together seamlessly to produce a clear picture. Definitions of Europe that have failed to take into account the labor and migration of women while discounting or disowning Eastern Europe altogether. Moreover, that book writes the picture by turning to films, one of many media which Anka reads as an astute cultural critic. Her latest book, Creolizing the Modern, co-authored with a sociologist and winner of the top book prize handed out by the American Comparative Literature Association, turns back to literature, to a single text, in fact, famous in Romania and largely unknown outside of it. In 1920, I'm going to mispronounce this name, Rebrenu, Rebrenu published his novel, Jan, the first modern Romanian novel in which he depicted the struggles over land ownership in rural Transylvania. This novel is read by every school child in Romania and by hardly anyone else, though I have a feeling that's going to change rather dramatically after the publishing of this book. Uh, in Creolizing the Modern, Anka takes up a seemingly simple question. Why is that? How is it, despite the expanding nature of world literature, that a famous novel of Eastern Europe can be so forgotten by the rest of the world? Knowledge about East Europe falls within the purview of sanctioned ignorance, she writes. The question, the concern, flows from a care Anka exhibits throughout her work, throughout all of her work, for the unseen, for the marginalized, for those on the edges, for those who have no voice, no power, whether because of where they live or how they live or who they happen to be. Anka works and writes on their behalf, and she shows how important it is to center those who have been left at the margins. In the case of Creolizing the Modern, for example, the novel Jan becomes a way to question the assumptions and definitions of world literature itself, challenging how we understand and define colonial, post-colonial, and imperial powers, and just as importantly, challenging how we go about doing the work that we do. That work, 
for Anka has to do with the central importance of culture and its artifacts. Anka is a premier scholar of the humanities, a champion of rigorous scholarly work in the humanities, dedicated to what the humanities as such can do. As she says in one book, my hope is that the humanities scholar as a humanities scholar can and should intervene in ongoing debates. And to that end, she does what does not appear in the profile of publications you have before you. She takes and trains more graduate students than almost any other humanities scholar I know. She trains them to take the humanities seriously. She trains them to think carefully. She trains them to know their stuff, to speak their thoughts clearly, and to produce incredible work. Anka's influence lives on in the lives of the many, many graduate students who have been fortunate to call her their advisor. And their work extends in its own way Anka's brilliance and dedication to the best that the humanities can be. All of this is just to say, which should already be absolutely clear, Anka is one of a kind, an extraordinary thinker, a brilliant writer, an excellent teacher, and a rigorous mentor who brings out the best in others and pushes whole fields in new directions, all driven by a constant care for the marginalized and the powerless. We are lucky to have her at Wash U, and I am honored to call her my colleague. Anka, I present you with this medallion as a symbol of your new appointment. And the front reads, these are not Diekman professor in comparative literature, arts and sciences, Washington University in St. Louis, 1853. Engraved in the back, it says, Anka Pavlescu, November 2nd, 2023. And here goes. It's pretty heavy. You can share that with <laughs> you can share that with Henrik until he has his own once in a while. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, Dean Hu. Uh, thank you, Abram, for that wonderful introduction. Um, thank you to my colleagues in the English department and my friends across campus. I am deeply honored to be here. I am particularly happy to be recognized with a name that honors Lisa Lotte Diekman and with a title in comparative literature. It might be counterintuitive to say this, but we have not always compared. Cognitive scientists posit comparison as a basic unit of human activity. We compare ourselves to others in the course of daily life. We compare the before and the after an event. We compare the here and the there. Comparison has likewise been an activity of literary studies. Many figures of speech are anchored in comparison. Intertextuality is a mode of comparison. Translation is a practice of comparison. And literary history has always paid attention to comparative social forms, like inequality. But as a systematic method, one that posits specific grounds for comparison and draws out specific arcs between the things compared, comparison emerged in the 19th century. A number of disciplines developed the comparative method roughly around the same time. As a discipline, comparative literature 
emerged out of this broad preoccupation with comparison in the 19th century in an effort to think literature as an inherently pluralistic activity. In its early days, it remained closely tied to linguistics. The word philology named a joint preoccupation with language and literature. Specifically, comparative literature promised to be the discipline that would approach literature as a multilingual activity. Now, the late 19th century was, of course, also the age of empire. Comparison emerged against an inter-imperial background as a mode of imperial rivalry on the one hand and as a mode of negotiating between empires on the other. In my brief talk today, I have about 20 minutes or so, uh, I, I plan to share three moments in the history of comparative literature and posit a link between them. The work I have done for my last book, Creolizing the Modern, Transylvania Across Empires, co-authored with Manuela Botko, zoomed in on what we take to be a crucial moment in the history of comparison and the discipline of comparative literature. The first journal of comparative literature was published in Transylvania starting in 1877. It was titled in Latin, Acta Comparationis Literarum Universarum. Transylvania was at the time part of the Hungarian side of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, an empire engaged in a project of managing its multi-ethnic and multilingual populations. At least six languages were used in Transylvania alone, Romanian, Hungarian, German, Yiddish, Romani, and Armenian, with the addition of French as a language of education in some institutions. At least 15 languages were spoken in the Austro-Hungarian Empire as a whole. In this multilingual context, Hugo Melzel, the editor of the journal, stated, and I quote, every nation today insists on the strictest monoglottism, right, monolingualism, by considering its own language superior or even destined to rule supreme. This is a childish competition. Comparative literature, as imagined by the journal and its editor, was meant to counter this trend towards monolingualism and nationalist competition. Melzel himself worked in German, Hungarian, Italian, and French. He proposed a revision of literary history through comparatism positing the joint principles of translation and polyglottism as a foundation for the discipline of comparative literature. Quote, the principle of translation has not to be replaced, but accompanied by a considerably more important comparative tool, the principle of polyglottism. before us the objects of our comparison in their original form, that is, in their original language. Melzel was interested in polyglot literary production, texts that, in one way or another, were multilingual at the moment of their writing. He argued for the need to engage with endangered languages and for the study of what he called literature-less people, so considered because their oral literary production was not recognized as literature. The discipline of comparative literature, Meltzel argued, could only be interdisciplinary, as it was already entangled with history, anthropology, and philosophy. Meltzel was an advocate for the study of what he called small languages and literatures. He nonetheless proposed that, for the time being, at the end of the 19th century, that is, polyglottism be supplemented by the principle of what he called decaglottism. This principle referred to the 10 European languages that he thought had made important contributions to world literature and achieved a certain classicism. All 10 were European languages. In this inaugural moment, the list of languages for the first journal in the discipline and for comparative, comparative literature more broadly was therefore highly selective. Most importantly, although based in multilingual Transylvania, Melzel did not join the call for linguistic rights in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. None of the minority languages of the empire were included on this list, only the two imperial languages, 
German, and, Hungari and Hungarian. What this brief survey, I hope, suggests is a double move that would remain symptomatic of comparative literature until today. A desire for a normative, multilingual ideal of literature and the study of literature, and an imperially inflected limiting of that principle, often in the name of practicality. I will now come to a, a second moment in the history of comparative literature I want to share with you today. Another crucial moment in the discipline's history sees comparative literature emerge in the context of another empire, the British Empire, in the work of Rabindranath Tagore, especially in a lecture titled In Bangla, uh, Visva Sahitya, World Literature, delivered in 1907. In the lecture, Tagore is proposing a concept of literature as a mode of aesthetic affective relation at a worldly scale. There are three kinds of relation, Tagore argues, intellectual, economic, and affective. They are mapped onto three spaces, the school, the workplace, the home. Tagore imagined the affective domain, also the domain of literature, as autonomous, the intellectual, economic field. He also imagined it as universal. This is a universality anchored in a notion of the self as relational. The self knows itself as it encounters others in the world. Tagore understands the world as expanding spatially in concentric circles from the home to the earth. And he sees it expanding diachronically uh, within world history. For Tagore, literature is a space of affective connection and expansion, thus necessarily world literature. Tagore, who wrote mostly in Bangla, had Sanskrit in his family background. He knew Maithili and Hindi. He was proficient in, in English, and he translated from French. In the formulation on the slide, Tagore draws attention to the title of his own talk, In Bangla, distinguishing his concept from what is called world literature in English. Again, in Bangla, I shall call it Visva Sahitya. He emphasizes here the necessity not only to consider an expansive archive of literature, but to theorize comparative literature and the comparative method in multiple languages, including his own, Bangla. Tagore's travels, this is Tagore in Romania in 1927. Uh, he was quite a star. Um, expanded his experience of multilingualism and translation. His own work was translated into countless languages and thus provided further ground for theorizing the worldliness, uh, the worldly dimension of literature. Embedded in such worldliness is a radical critique of nationalism, including its postcolonial varieties. And it's well known that Tagore has a consequential debate with Gandhi about nationalism. In this moment in the history of comparative literature, we also witness a dynamic and a tension between a desired multilingual expansiveness and a reduction of that desire. The reception history of Tagore's text is symptomatic here, having only been recently recovered for a worldly history of comparative literature once it was translated into English. A third moment, and the last I will share with you. Um, sees the discipline being rejuvenated or reinvented in 1930s Istanbul. The context here is the immediate aftermath of the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire and the modernizing efforts to establish a modern Turkish state. This note involves, centrally, German scholar of Romance languages and literatures, Eric Auerbach, as a refugee from fascist Europe in Istanbul during the 1930s. Turkey accepted refugees fleeing fascism and were enlisted in a project of modernization that involved distancing the new modern state from its entanglement with the, with the Ottoman Empire. In Istanbul, Auerbach wrote My Nieces, to this day one of the most influential works in comparative literature. Auerbach himself worked in German, French, Italian, Latin, Greek, English, Spanish, and Provencal. This moment in the history of the discipline is tied to Edward Said's reading of Auerbach and coining the phrase Auerbach in Istanbul to name a postcolonial shift in, um, within comparative literature. Said writes that my Mises constitutes, and I quote, 
a massive reaffirmation of the Western cult uh, cultural tradition, but also a work built upon a critically important alienation from it, a work whose conditions of, and circumstances of existence are not immediately derived from the culture it describes, which such extraordinary insight and brilliance, but, rather, but built rather on an agonizing distance from it distance from home and the very idea of home, in this case, distance from Europe and European literature become uh, comparative ethos. Importantly, is Elote Dickman, and by extension, Washington University in St. Louis, were part of this note in the history of comparative literature. Like Auerbach, uh, Lisa Lotte Dickman had to flee Germany in the 1930s and became a refugee alongside her husband, Herbert Dickmann, a scholar of the French Enlightenment, she found refuge in Istanbul in the 1930s, where she worked as a lecturer in German and Greek at the Istanbul Foreign Language School. In September 1938, Lisa Lotte and Herbert Dickmann emigrated to the United States and came to St. Louis. Dickmann wrote about her exile in Istanbul. More so than the other European refugees, she was aware that the Turkish state in an effort to rapidly modernize and whitewash its relation to Ottoman history, was replacing Turkish professors with European exiles, unwittingly enlisting them in a project of nationalism similar to the one that caused their exile. She writes, the Turkish professors who were ruthlessly dismissed or otherwise reprimanded. The project, as Auerbach wrote in a letter, involved, and I quote, a fanatical anti-traditional nationalism a renunciation of all Islamic cultural tradition. What emerges from this note in the history of comparative literature, as Edward Said understands the European comparatives in exile in Istanbul, is an expansion of their horizon beyond the purview of Romance language and literatures, an expansion that included learning non-European languages, and a methodological distancing from one's object of study. At the same time, Auerbach would deplore what he saw as an ever-expanding archive of world literature, thus effectively limiting the horizon of his own project. Importantly, this is also an imperial and post-imperial node. A rejuvenated comparative literature invented in Istanbul promised to combat nationalism, even as it faced the prospect of other nationalisms. How we tell the history of comparative literature matters. It matters what beginning we imagine for our fields, for our methods. As we know from the opening of literary texts, a beginning enables, it projects, it promises, and it risks. The beginning will retro retrospectively project structures the present of the discipline. The historian tracing the history of comparative literature chooses a formal point of departure from the perspective of which one projects a hypothesis about comparative literature. The, stake, the stakes of the exercise become more concrete if one asks the question pedagogically, how do we narrate the past of comparative literature to a new generation of students? Where does the syllabus begin? How do we risk a beginning that is necessarily multiple, allowing the members of the class students engaged, in the literatures of the, uh, engaged with the literatures of the world to do comparative work. Even more challengingly, how do we negotiate such a beginning institutionally, since we are always already told that comparative literature begins with Goethe? <laughs> Furthermore, how to set a beginning of a multilingual project in English, the language in which this conversation largely happens. My modest proposal is for a creolized history of comparative literature, a capacious world history of the discipline and of the comparative method. Creolization here means both mixed, these nodes um, are constituted by a mix of heterogeneous and unequal elements, and relational, the various moments in this history are in relation. See Tagore in Bucharest, for example. Aside from the three nodes I shared, other important moments include a translation project in Egypt after Napoleon's invasion, the emergence of comparison as a literary preoccupation in Taiwan under Japanese occupation, and a project of translation in early Soviet Union and to bring together the people of the East. While the stories we tell carry important resonances for all disciplines, 
I believe this is particularly important for comparative literature. The last vignette I shared, Auerbach, and we can now add Lizalotte Dickman in Istanbul, also gave us, again via Edward Said, a working notion of post-war humanism. This humanism anchored what we call the humanities in a broad sense. Following this genealogy, the humanities, inheritors of philology as a broad project itself with a worldly dimension, cannot but be comparative. Bill Matheson endowed this professorship in honor of Lizalotte Dickman, whose scholarship and leadership he admired. But Matheson also remembered Dickman as the most dedicated instructor. I am particularly honored to be tied to this aspect of her legacy. I see the humanities, the comparative humanities, at work on a daily basis in the work of my graduate students. This is a slide with some of my former graduate students, currently affiliated with institutions and various projects in St. Louis, nationally, and around the world. And these are my current graduate students, many of whom are here. I'm so glad to see you. As always, it is reassuring to know that our students are way ahead of us. Here is what I see in their work. Their projects are anchored in expanded and generous archives and are attentive to the very question of the archive. These projects are deeply multilingual, whether that means working with multiple languages or unpacking the inherent multilingualism embedded synchronically and diachronically in one language. Some of the languages at work in no particular order include Hindi, Arabic, Spanish, Latvian, Slovene, Jata, Yoruba, French, Bosnian, Japanese. These projects are attentive to the work of translation and other modes of literary circulation, as well as the lack of such circulation. They work with a solid sense of how world literature both interlocks world history and intervenes in it, creating worlds of its own. They unpack the often disjunctive relations between social and aesthetic forms. Their projects are often inter-arts, theorizing literature's relation to other arts, including photography, film, the graphic arts, and music. They are often multimedia, cutting across contemporary and historic media platforms, including new digital media. They cross the written oral divide in the definition of literature at a worldly scale. They seek to establish a level plane of analysis as grounds for comparison against the acknowledged history of an uneven playing field. They are savvy about the workings of race and comparative racializations. They reimagine the relation between academic work and the public sphere. They theorize institutions of literature that function as an infrastructure of literary recognition and underpin the, working, the workings of power within the World Republic of Letters. <coughs> Finally, they work with a creolized, multilingual body of literary theory. This is what I see when I look at my students' work. The humanities, the comparative humanities, are doing great. The rest of us would do well to pay attention. I'll leave you with this line in Eric Auerbach's essay, The Philology of World Literature, and I quote, in any event, our philological home is the earth. It can no longer be the nation. Among other things, with renewed force today, the humanities are called upon to offer accounts of comparative nationalisms around the world, including linguistic, literary, and academic nationalisms. Much as, at the end of the 19th century, Hugo Melzel believed nationalisms would soon disappear, much as Tagore advocated for a postcolonial path other than nationalism. 
much as Auerbach and Diekmann fled a genocidal state nationalism only to realize that their place of refuge enlisted their pedagogical work in another state nationalism. A number of nationalisms are resurfaci resurfacing around the world. These are heterogeneous nationalist projects, some old, some new, some state-sponsored, others claimed by minority groups, some secular, some entangled with religion, some violent, some peaceful. We need the comparative humanities to help us weigh the cultural and historical claims made in the name of these nationalisms. The history of comparative literature can hopefully help us counter the resurgence of nationalism with a certain kind of humanism, a humanism without a universalized human that can perhaps still speak to our shared fate. Our bar's formulation invites us to reconsider the vocabulary we use to name and qualify literature, as in world literature, the world, the globe, the planet, but perhaps in a radical, literal sense, now more than ever, the earth. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Anka, so much for sharing a slice of your scholarship, outstanding scholarship today. And congratulations to you and to your family and your friends again. Uh, I am so grateful to have you on the faculty, and I'm so grateful that you chose Washu as your academic home. And this concludes the formal portion of the ceremony today. And please join us out there for the reception.